Hello and welcome to Mid-America Buddhist Association, MABA. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So this morning, I would like to start uh, my Dhamma talk with a quote from Chinese Buddhism. Okay. And the mind follows the external objects. And the second one is the external objects follow the mind. Actually, these two quotes are quite common found in the Chinese Tivitaka, so I did not put the citations here. Um, the Chan master mentioned this several times, quite often. Even the master from Huayan school, from Madhya Maka school, Yogacara school, and Savasthi schools, they all talk about the minds and the external objects in their commentaries or in their explanation of the Dharma. So today I would like my talk actually basically focus on the first one because there is more about uh, the minds of the ordinary people. So what is that mean? The mind follows the external objects. And the master says that the mind that follows the external objects is suffering. And if the external objects follow the enlightened mind, that is uh, please. Okay. So I would like to explain um, how the mind follow the external objects or the external world <coughs> using the using the dependent called arising. Okay. So some of the masters will divide the twelve links of dependent co arising into three parts. So most of the ordinary people or with the untrained mind, they how their how their life reacts to the external. Mostly they are in the cycle of craving, clinging, resistance, birth and death again and again. All this is once they contact with the outside, immediately they cling to it. Or if they don't like it, they run away from it. Actually, running away from something is also another kind of craving, another kind of tanha, okay? So this is how uh, we can see the people live in the mundane world and react to the external world again and again. This is the cycles. Very few people, okay, very few people able to look back or willing to look inside how and what drive the craving that arise. So the enlightened one, like the Buddhas and his disciples, when they contemplate inner deeply, then they found that oh, it is because of the feeling that arises inside myself, not because of the outside. And that is because the content of the six senses of this body and the mind. And then when they keep uh, tracking back deeply, then they found that the deep root inside is the ignorance. So the consciousness embedded with the ignorance, then it triggers the reactions of a life, okay? And then how it reacts outside, externally, by craving, clinging, and then the birth and death repeat again and again. <clears throat> so, and the teachings of the Buddha is so profound and not many people able to perceive and understand it. That's why, but the Buddha is very wise, very compassionate, okay, and he did not give up all, most of the people who cannot understand at the first, okay. He has his own um, skillful means to insert his profile teachings in simple stories. So the stories with the objects or subjects that relate with the external world, that presence in our environments, in our life, okay. So when we read the Buddha stories in the past, especially in the Jatakas, you'll find that Buddha used a lot of uh, similes or metaphors 
and you can find that there are other beings that relates to us like he will use lion rods you know to um, to show the power of the telling the truth horses cows monkeys you know uh, to uh, describe how the wandering mind is and then using banana trees to show that how insubstantial of the things that we grab to and then different levels different stages of the lot to scroll in the points just like different levels of the mentalities of the people in the world okay lotus under the water is like people who with lots of dust in their eyes they are not ready yet not ready to hear the profound teachings yet and only the few lotus flowers that already go above the waters they're able and ready to understand okay they also have many other stories so today i would like to learn a bit from the buddha and i would like to start my talk by telling uh, three uh, simple stories using animals. First, I want to mention ego. Okay, bull eagle is the symbol of uh, the national birds of the United States. So during when the thunderstorm comes, the winds strong and there are lots of rains. Many small birds, you know, parrots, ravens, and other small birds, they quickly look for places hide under the tree branches or those that are shade okay and shivering and look for shelters whereas eagle okay they will take the chance you know to glide up to much higher altitudes by taking the air currents that rising up to the skies Okay, that is how the max, you know, in the same condition, the same phenomenon, uh, and uh, the situation, ego has this kind of characteristic, fearless characteristic, and he has this strong power. Not only he can take uh, the difficulties as an opportunity to fly higher, to to the higher attitude, so that he can he able to have a bigger version visions of. The view okay so ego is a symbol of fearless okay he has a broad world, uh, visions able to see far and uh, broad and then he is not afraid of the difficult uh, the challenge that come to you come to us okay so what does uh, the ego symbolize it symbolizes that we if we learn from the ego then try to learn to be a broad-minded person and not like all those small birds small birds are the narrow-minded people beings okay let's learn and always take the figures the broad-minded figures as our examples so that we will not be defeated by the difficulties or challenge in the life but take those as the difficulties as the opportunity that can drive us to a higher attitude, that can transcend, you know, the mundane level. It's the same when we come to the spiritual practice, okay? It's not easy, actually. Even meditation is not easy for everybody. There are many hindrances. The first hindrances, first level of hindrances is the five obstacles, okay? So sometimes the diff most difficult it hindrances not come from outside not necessarily come from outside but can be from the inside do we have this kind of fearless to face and then to deal with it or whether we want to run away and then want to stay in our comfort zone so it is up to us who we want to learn from the small bird or the big bird like the eagle and then the second one i want to talk about is the salmon fish okay Salmon fish is a muscle thriving in the environments. We know that salmon, they uh, grow in the fresh, clear waters, okay, upstream. And then when they grow up, they have to migrate thousand miles away back to the oceans, okay. And when they are, uh, reach the mature states, they need to migrate back to their original habitats. So they are the migrating fish. They never have a fixed hometown 
or place to stay. Okay, and the whole life, you know, whether they are traveling to the oceans or back to their hometown, they always have to face lots of uh, prey, you know, challenges, difficulties, but at the same time, they are also growing, they are thriving. When they mature, they bring back all the nutrients from the oceans back to the upstreams of the river. And they are not only, not only for their work for this, for their own, for their own purpose, you know, to nourish the next generation. But when they die, they also feed the soil uh, in their hometown, okay? So this also, we learned, we're able to learn from them that if we really have a goal and a lofty goal, okay, work for it, not afraid of the, the strong currents that are against us. So it's the same when we want to transcend these are uh, the challenges, then get ready, fearless of it, okay? Be determined, be goal-oriented, okay? Not oh, have this ready, not to be washed away, but have the power to move forward. And not only along the way, not only we uh, grow, but we also able to nourish and benefit the beings and the environments around us. So these two uh, things that uh, we can know, be familiar, and that we can learn from, even from a very tiny creatures like ants also can give us a big lesson. So ants, we know the ants, they live in colonies, okay? And actually ants do not have a leader. They do not have a commander. Nobody give them instructions. You can tell that. But somehow they just know, maybe just in their instinct, they just know that how to work together, okay? And they will never stop. And they know how to overcome the gaps, the water that come to them, and all those big rock in front of them. They will not say, oh, this is a big rock we cannot cross. No, what they, what they do is they know how to look for ways to turn around and continue the way. You see from the photos, there's a gap. But they are not they are not limited, restricted by the size, you know. They know how to work together and then overcome the gaps and then collect and work forward uh, to for their own common goods, you know. None of them would think that, oh, I want to be the leader, I want to be different from the others. So let me stand up and then look different. No, you know, here we cannot tell who is who, but we know that as a group, as a colony, this is the end. This is their spirit. They are self-motivated. And then they all work together, come together for the goodness of their own colony. So this also can give us a lesson that when we learn from them, when we have difficulties, let's come together Let's come together and then when we put the efforts together, we were able to overcome. Well, so when we can learn so much from the environment, sometimes but without a proper um, wisdom or guidance, this contact with the external objects sometimes will trigger the unwholesome desire, like what we say, greed clinging okay and we do not see that not only our minds always always the moment we contact we follow and cling to the external objects in fact our lives the human lives is totally depends on the world the external world okay if we look from the ecosystems the huge um from the bird view of the ecosystem, we can see that human beings is only a subset of this ecology. Other human, other beings, other plants, they continue to try uh, to grow, to thrive without human beings. They're able to do that. 
but human beings cannot survive without them. If our ecology collapse, okay, but somehow humans might without well sometimes they are just yeah just uh, too much illusions that we do not see the consequences of the clinging because of the selfishness okay because of these selfish desires we are more and more okay i remember when i was small still a very little kid i read a story you know uh, a group of kids they pray under the trees you know they rest under uh, under the shade of a tree and then they enjoy the fruit from the trees okay those trees never complains and when the kids grow up as an adult they come back and then what they do is to my surprise they did not pay respect or want to say thank you they come back to chop down the trees and the trees are crying this is how it looks like so as a kid i was i did not understand the story actually why we want to hurt and chop down our parents that nourish our life okay but after i grow up as an adult then i realized that the story has no problem it is me that who as a kid did not know that this is the reality the pictures the story only tells the reality the realities of the selfishness of the humankind so humans is not uh, human is not the strongest is not the largest and uh, courageous on the earth however the mind power is so strong you know it's so powerful that it can turn the ecology the very calm green serene forest the ecology so-called into another kind of forest i call it metal iron forest okay and that one was built on the human ego the human sentiments so i put a term on it called ego system actually uh, the green forest on your left that you can see that is from my hometown i haven't gone back home for more than 10 years but my last impression in me memory of my hometown the forest in my hometown is what you see on the forest it's green and it's so vibrant inside the inside the forest okay but maybe, maybe for many city people forest is a dangerous place that we cannot go without gears and now i'm in a big city many people i know who grew up in the big city they enjoy the luxuries of the materials in the big city and they have very good life but i want to tell you that i also see stress i see poverty i see insecurity i see all these exhausted and fatigued faces in the city always so i don't know whether this so-called modern civilizations of humans is it really benefits all humans and other beings and when humans are so absorbed indulged in the world that they build on that we build on okay we slowly lost the contact we lost the connections with the nature we don't know we forget about the language of the nature okay yeah and now with the developments of the so-called uh, the internet or the virtual world we have another third world that we don't seem to able to we don't seem to need to connect with the nature anymore but do you see that actually the Buddha already gave us for a warning 2000 more than 2500 years ago it says that with the ignorance as the conditions and so on with this and this as the conditions it will give to the rise of the whole mass of suffering and this is the wrong way how and what is the right way is to cease to subdue the ignorance okay 
So with the ignorance, without the proper guidance, the desire will lead to the wrong way with either ignorance, okay? And it will cause a huge disruptions. What are the disruptions? For example, now I just want to briefly go through the consequences of the human activities, our actions all together, okay? Cumulative human activities. We are able to change the world temperatures within less than 100 years. And now, this is what we are experiencing now. The four elements of this earth is totally imbalanced. It's not only great heat, fire. Some places, they are facing droughts, had uh, serious droughts. And then some other places having floods. So the four elements in the world is disrupted. And we able to feel it actually. If you see that, oh, this topic is too huge, okay? It's not related to my life, but actually everybody is experiencing it. We can feel it, okay? Why the bills is higher? Why is sometimes it's difficult to get certain things? It's not as easy as before. And why we get sick easily? All this is because somehow it's directly or indirectly caused by our own actions together since several decades ago. And then if we do not make changes, our next generations, you know, our next next generations, parents, children, grandchildren, and so on, they will be facing even more severe condition than what we are facing right now. And this is the paper that I read a few days ago. It says that the climate change not only causing the, uh, the damage in the environment, it also will increase, you know, the pathogenic diseases being aggravated. That means what human will be have the higher risk exposed to being infected by the disease. We don't have to mention uh, too far or many other unfamiliar names to us. Let's look at, let's have a look at the COVID that is not end yet. This is the data from last night. So how many people already been sick and die because of the, this invisible uh, virus? And why is not so is so widespread and become a global uh, infections. Lots of the time is because human actions. If we are able to be more, um, how to say, thoughtful, be mindful, I think the spread of the virus can be under control. United States claim to be the most powerful, most developed countries in the world and it able to provide the highest amounts of the vaccine to against the virus but still you know united states has the highest records of the confirmed cases and death i don't know whether the science or the so-called advancement technology advancement able to prevent this or able to protect us protect its people from all this suffering and disasters and the, in the next few months, in November, the United Nations predict that the global human population will reach 8 million. Okay, what does that mean? That means there will be more people competing for food, for oxygen, clean air, clean water, and shelters. Okay, and let's look again. That means more people were fighting for the uh, very limited and natural resources. At the same time, other species are uh, extinctions, you know, extinct from the environments. In the past 10 years, the extinction rates of the, all uh, many other animals, plants, is 100 times faster than the case before, than centuries before. Do you know that every species that is extinct take out from the uh, food chains, then our food chain in the ecology will be shaken, getting weaker, okay? So 
not have and what is really bring the the severe damage is the main created walls it's so devastated that i don't have to mention it but you can search on it online easily it's much more uh, damaging than we can imagine and in fact the carbon dioxide emissions of the largest military actually is greater than many of the world's countries that combine together and in, so so my point here is i don't want to give a talk on the environment or how to protect the environment what i want to show here is this is how the world looks like or the results of it that is dominated by the human minds or the deluded minds that not only think follows but also exploit it so now how can we turn it away i mean turn around the good things that we learn about the dharma the dependent arising is we know that things can be changed if we change the causes and conditions so there are two ways you know at least two ways to treat the symptoms and treat the root cause what it means by treating the symptoms the hard approaches soft approaches hard approaches like you enforce the strict uh, laws and regulations so policy makers make sure that make uh, you you people make the laws that friendly with the ecology and architects engineers okay and many other peoples when you do create something please includes the green ideas into it what is soft approaches educations promotions movements okay and for ordinary people so we can take actions that to prevent so there is the proactive actions we also can save or contribute passively passively means yes we recycle items we try to reduce our carbon dioxide expenses okay and things like that and another one another approach which is really important is treating the root cause that is training the mind to subdue to eliminate this self ego or the self clinging the attachment that is what we are doing as a buddhist okay especially uh monks okay the monastic we devote our whole life time and efforts into cultivating the insight by uh, penetrating the, the self okay and for the lay people who lay buddhist if you are still active in the society and make full use play your role whoever you are you are teachers you are lawyers you are doctors you are lawmakers you are the engineers keep this into into your work and then not just for the profit okay that is all i would like to say because if you think that if buddhists only talk about meditation peace and calm please have a look at the satipatthana suttas it starts with saying that man having gone to the forest the root of a tree or empty place okay and then you sit cross leg keep the body erect and mindfulness alert mindful breathe in mindful breathe out there are two conditions we need to uh, be aware here is talk about the external environments the place that we live okay so people can meditate at home you know if your room is quiet serene peaceful okay and then you have your own ac system nobody can disrupt you but can we run away from the external suffering no maybe one day the power off okay there'll be super hot and we don't know when is the next fresh flood will come to us okay next is about our body conditions if our back pain leg pain okay can we sit upright erect the body and if our respiratory system is being infected keep coughing can we mindful our breath in and out smoothly no so what we learn from the first sentence is they are prerequisite the body healthy conditions the external living conditions are so important okay they are the prerequisite for us to start the meditation so this 
And if we continue to look into the suttas, it says that contemplates the body internally, externally, internal and externally. So internally is the basic level of practice. Only if we are able to get rid of or penetrate itself, then we are able to extend it to externally. Externally means the external people or things that we contact. Okay, at the most advanced level is able to contemplate external and internally, okay, without shaking, without the mind being shaken. Okay, so when we go through the whole suttas, there is no word saying that if you contemplate in this way, then you will enter peace and calm and not being disrupted. No, it says that when we contemplate contemplate and practice in internally, then let's continue externally, internally and externally. That means it did not tell us that we have, we can cut the bond or connections with the external. So here, I want to come back to the words, uh, to the quotes. This is how our deluded minds follow the external objects, always shaking, always clinging attached, okay? Before we are able to transcend to the another level, the enlightenment, okay, we always have to make sure that please protect and keep the external conditions in a good shape that is conducive not only for us but also for others. The Buddha says that the words, all the phenomena are subject to impermanence. They are like the like they are like dreams, like bubbles like phantoms, okay? So before we wake up from the dreams, please let uh, us hope that we all have a good dream. When we are still in the dream, be nice to everyone in the dream and then protect and preserve what we have, okay? So may we all be patient, thoughtful to others, okay? And I hope that May we able to be more empathy and compassionate to others, less complaint, and be more appreciate and giving, less judgment, less discriminations. We have more contemplations and not complaining. Okay, and the last is be elastic. What does that mean? Always able to adapt, go with the conditions, not go with the self views. All right, thank you. That is my talk uh, this morning. Okay, thank you for your attention and for listening. Uh, I think now is the time for us to uh, chanting. I hope we'll keep all the Buddha's teachings in our mind and then contemplate it while we are chanting together with compassion and loving kindness in our mind.